so I guess before I get to the demo, kind of give some background. Um, we we conducted a uh, internal research project to to look at um, the underlying low level components that we felt would be necessary to to achieve um, real time motion planning. So the two areas we focused on was collision checking, and the second area was the 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 nonlinear optimizer um, and uh, the methods used for calculating cost constraints for both avoiding collisions and, and maintaining a variety of different uh, types of Cartesian constraints for the type of processes we were dealing at. Um, so in this process, uh, we went through and we profiled and optimized uh, several of our collision checkers. Um, we were able to, to significantly improve them uh, for distance queries between an object and all objects in the environment. Um, so we were able to, to get like bullet and FCL up to where we're able to perform uh, looking at it between 15,000 and 25,000 collision requests uh, a second. So that means we, we move an object in the environment, we say calculate collisions, and it will go through and calculate all possible contact pairs within some distance threshold. So that's kind of what this chart shows. So we were able to, to in the case of bullet, get it to three to five times X and FCL, we were able to significantly improve it by uh, making some underlying changes to it to, to better handle uh, distance calculations uh, than what's currently available by default. Uh, we also implemented uh, both a CPU and GPU. Uh, and the GPU uh, significantly improves in uh, distance queries. Uh, compared to the CPU-based one. Um, the other piece of it, we, 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 most of our optimization-based motion planners are built, uh, or we're currently leveraging Trajox for doing that. So, um, but it did not support this functionality of just updating and doing like a, a single time step solve. It kind of was configured so you get it and it would solve for the whole trajectory. You weren't able to, to manually step through it. So we actually, took a step back, we analyzed uh, what, what frameworks were available uh, to leverage. Uh, and in that process, we settled on using uh, IFOPT. It's an uh, open sourced uh, eigenbased framework for doing nonlinear optimization. Um, so we rewrote Tradjob from the ground up using that framework to support this uh, single time step solve. So we could uh, do more dynamic control of the trajectory um, in, in real time and uh, provide us more flexibility. So uh, it is out there uh, under the Tragop repository. We're kind of maintaining both of them at the moment until we get all of the functionality from the old version migrated into what, what we're calling Tragop Dipop. Uh, and then we'll, we'll deprecate the, the old version and proceed with the, the new version. Um, the nice thing is, is uh, by moving to IPOP, it, it opened up additional solvers like SNOP and IPOP that were already integrated for that framework in addition to, to the ones that we currently had implemented. So I'm going to show a demonstration. Uh, can you see the robot cell that I have here? Um, yeah, so we'll put good. together. All right. So we have a, a two-axis gantry with a six-off manipulator. Uh, and the cylinder you see there is uh, more or less uh, simulating a person in the environment. And what we're going to do is we're, we're, we have a free space motion that we need to go from this start position to a Cartesian location. And we're able to run this and you're able to move the cylinder around and see how that trajectory changes based on um, the cylinder moving in the environment. So I'm going to go ahead and start it. All right, so what you see here is the, the trad job, and it's running. You can see the terminal down the left. It's actually the, the, the nonlinear solver solving about 900 hertz is what we're running right now. So I'm going to move the person around, and you're going to be able to see the, the trajectory move, right? So we've got, um, and we can go past. So it's pretty responsive, right? The tra trajectory tries to stay away from the cylinder as much as it can. Um, so 
some cases where I'm seeing we're getting down to about seven, 800 hertz when we get really close to the object, when it can't move away, the solver is really trying. But once you get out, we're running about 1,000 to 1,200 hertz. Uh, this is just using the CPU base. It's not using our GPU uh, at the moment. Uh, this is just using that. Um, the next step for this is uh, our, our plan is to, to integrate this into a controller. Uh, that that could uh, leverage this type of solver to to during execution, uh, uh, because you have the ability to define all types of cost constraints uh, uh, using Trajop. That we could build a controller that could, while execution, uh, could dynamically avoid obstacles in the environment. Uh, it could be a person or uh, another robot, uh, things like that. I think that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions? So this capability is already open source or embedded in Tesseract, correct? Yes. So it's yeah, it's open source. The 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 nonlinear solver uh, framework integration uh, is called Trajop Ipop. It's under uh, Trajop Roth, um, and uh, the planner is that leverages these is both available in, in Tetheract. And then we have, we're still seeking to like, as you said, integrate this on a appropriate hardware, right? Yes, like yeah, so that's the next Tesla. step. We have another IR project that we're gonna, that we are leveraging this to, to hopefully integrate on hardware and, and see this in action. Uh, to, I think the plan is to leverage ROS control uh, or something similar to, to do the controller uh, leveraging this underlying uh, solver for providing That's updates right. to the trajectory. Yeah, we're yeah. leveraging this. Uh, yeah, hi, Levi, this is John Wen. Uh, so we're, we're uh, you, you know, trying to use it uh, for our test bed for multiple robot collision avoidance. Cool, John. Thanks. Yep. Excellent. Yeah, and, and then so yeah, just a little bit of insight, right? So for those of you who've been here on pers on campus where we demonstrated the markerless motion capture, um, the, the, the internal research that Levi has mentioned will combine that markerless motion capture with this capability, right? So we can actually perceive uh, the human as he's demonstrated with the cylinder. Um, though some days I feel like I look like a cylinder, um, but, uh, but actually capture people and then see how well the system may respond. So that is some, some of the kind of work we hope to be able to share soon that'll actually show this some of this running on hardware. So stay tuned, Levi, any other questions for Levi? Yeah, I have one question about the nature of the obstacles that are supported. You have a cylinder there, um, a more complex, uh, like a cost map, would that slow down the loop time significantly? Um, again, I, can you repeat? So you're right now, yeah, so we're using convex holes. I think we've added cylinders for the human, but uh, um, adding the, like say if you wanted to add more complex shapes to represent the person, um, it, it does slow down a little bit, but not much. Now, the one thing is, as we found with our GPU, we actually see no slowdown. Uh, it's actually very negligible. Uh, mainly because it, uh, um, it it can perform very well uh, for the GPU one. The CPU will slow down just a little bit, but um, you you may be talking um, a few hertz, maybe 100 hertz slower than what it's running now, but not significantly. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks. Thanks, Levi. Any other questions? Thanks, Zach. Hi Levi, this is uh, this is Gijs. I had a question. Um, so you're still using serial solvers here, right? Is that correct? Sequential solvers. Um, say that again. We're using serial solvers. We're using SQP solvers. Yeah, so sequential solvers, right? Yeah. So now this is a. Uh, uh, I mean, 
great work, obviously. It seems to work pretty nice. Um, but I'm curious, so if this is sort of a collision avoidance behavior, did you ever sort of run into situations where that's going to be competing with uh, with other constraints that you've uh, or costs that you've uh, added to the problem description where it wasn't really able to to find a, um, a, a sort of, you know, I would say this uh, logical or natural solution uh, because as there's basically no way to inform or uh, impart some sort of hierarchy on these um, on these sort of constraints in a, in a sequential solver. Um, I've seen some really weird stuff happening sometimes. So I'm just curious whether you ran into this as well and, and what your approach has been then. Yeah, so we, we have ran into that. So you do end up getting uh, like one of them. We, we typically don't turn on, say, collision and velocity smoothing. Uh, we only have, say, acceleration and jerk just because velocity and at least the velocity cost and the collision cost are competing, right? The, the, the velocity small, the velocity cost wants to shorten joint motion, but collision wants to push it away, and then, then they compete with each other. So we, we do see um, those types of uh, competing constraints and costs. Um, and typically, we, we've been handling that in our uh, motion pipeline. So we'll, we'll solve once with a set of costs and constraints on, and then we'll transition to, um, we'll repeat again with a different set of costs and constraints with different weights and things like that, uh, or other approaches and then, that we have and to then use. If you, if you run the same problem twice with different constraints, do you combine the results or something? How does that work? So, so we'll solve first. So like sometimes, uh, like turning con collision as a constraint on to start is, can be problematic, right? Uh, that we've experienced. So we'll run like first iteration, we'll, we'll do a quick solve with collision as cost to kind of get things out of contact. And then we'll turn on the constraints for say collision and solve it again using the previous solve as the initial condition for the secondary solve. Right, so like a seed basically. Basically, yeah, yep. Okay, thanks. Um, but but we do have interested in looking at uh, um, other solvers that, that that are more hierarchical solvers. I think is what you may be getting at, right? That that work well for solving this type of condition. Well, the hierarchical solvers are are indeed a way to uh, to 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 sort of address this, but they obviously come with their own. Uh, drawback. So, but I was just curious whether you ran into this uh, and had some sort of uh, nice way to uh, work around it or something. But um, you know, the, what you mentioned by by sort of steering the the solver in a certain direction by using the seat as the which was the outcome of a previous run with different set of constraints and costs sounds like a like a nice sort of workaround for this. Yeah. Yeah, and and we have found that the commercial solvers we don't run into this or nearly as much. Um, like if you use Gyrobi or are one of those that, that has support with, with Trajop, they must be doing something similar internally because uh, they seem to just work. So I'm assuming they're either relaxing costs and constraints based on certain information uh, because uh, we don't have really any issues with using commercial solvers version versus the open source like uh, I think the default run right now is OSQP, uh, but we we have QP Oasis and uh, others. We're interested in trying uh, Snopt and iPop too to see how how well those perform. Yeah, will be interesting. Uh, interesting to see. Thanks.